So uh, this morning, 1 Samuel, 20, 1 Samuel chapters 24, 25 and 26, and the reason that we've got three chapters in there, I'm only going to take a wee bit from each, I promise. It'll only take us just shy of an hour and 40. <laughs> um, is the idea is that we'll see here in this, these three chapters something that happens by the way that David reacts to the situations that he finds himself in. And these three chapters are really good. And really, they have to be taken together in order to see the growth, if you like, and the, the maturity that comes into um, David's decision making in the heat of a moment. Um, and as I pointed out a few weeks ago, David didn't and doesn't always get it right. He gets things wrong. Who else gets things wrong? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, quite often we can get things wrong. And, and I also want to ask a rhetorical question. You can answer it in your heart. You don't have to uh, shout out. How easy is it to take matters into our own hands? We've perhaps been waiting for an opportunity. And what we think, the opportunity arrives. And we seek to grasp it with both hands it, without hesitation. And immediately then, in the moment... We do just that without consulting God first. Often when we're praying for things, Lord, I need a breakthrough here or there. Lord, I need your help or your hand on this situation. The first thing that we see, we think that's it. And sometimes it is. But sometimes it isn't. But every opportunity, we have to or should make sure that we seek God and his plan first. As Christians, we have to be so careful that we don't attempt to forge our own path. And this, of course, can occur from a, a myriad of different things. In the first instance, it might just be a wee bit over-presumptuous. It could be self-confidence that I've got this. It could even be a lack of understanding or insight. It could be even self-destructive behaviour. That that seems like a route, so I'll take it. Not consulting what God's idea is on the whole situation. And of course it could be a lack of direction, not because God isn't wanting to give it to us, but because we don't want to look and we don't want to listen. If this is all sounding familiar, then this will be a talk for you and for me. That so often we can make these silly mistakes... And there are times when there are many factors in place. David has been uh, anointed as the future king of Israel. Yet, as I say future, he's not on the throne as it were. Saul had been anointed as king, but Saul had gone his own route. And Saul had lost favour with God. And so God, via Samuel, had anointed David as Israel's future king. But in the meantime, he had a few decisions to make about how he would handle God's instruction. And ultimately, what kind of king then, what kind of man David would become. And in these three chapters that I've mentioned, David is presented with three different scenarios where he could easily have interpreted God's timing as now. It must be now. And there would certainly, as we'll read through these chapters, there would have been a completely different ending to what we know indeed happened. Firstly, in 1 Samuel chapter 24, David is hiding in a cave from Saul, the vengeful king. Saul is after blood. He wants David gone. And David is hiding in the cave, far back in the cave. And Saul comes in to relieve himself. And he finds himself in a situation that he actually has no idea about until David, <coughs> until David reveals to him exactly what has happened. So 1 Samuel, uh, 1 Samuel wow, that was weird, uh, chapter 24 um, and verse 1 through 7. It says, after Saul returned from pursuing the Philistines, he was told David is in the desert of En Gedi. 
So Saul took 3,000 able young men from all Israel and set out to look for David and his men near the crags of the wild goats. If anybody knows that, it's just south of the river. I mean, honestly, it's always important to make sure you're listening. He came uh, to the sheepfolds along the way. A cave was there and Saul went in to relieve himself. David and his men were far back in the cave. The men said, they were whispering by the way, this is the day the Lord spoke of when he said to you, I will give your enemy into your hands for you to deal with as you wish. It's got to be, hasn't it? It's got to be. Then David crept up unnoticed, as we'll find out from these, uh, certainly two of these accounts, David was clearly a stealth ninja, <laughs> right? This guy knew how to creep up on somebody and go unnoticed. He was clearly a complete ninja. So David crept up unnoticed and he cut off a corner of Saul's robe. Afterwards, David was conscious stricken. Anybody had a a stricken conscience? <laughs> yes, we have. Um, so he was conscious stricken for having cut off a corner of his robe. And he said to his men, The Lord forbid that I should do such a thing to my master, the Lord's anointed. Remember, or lay a hand on him, for he is the anointed of the Lord. With these words, David sharply rebuked his men and did not allow them to attack Saul. And Saul left the cave and went on his way. David received some reality in this moment. Firstly, he received some bad counsel. I won't ask you to raise your hand if you've received bad counsel before. And I don't mean your elected member. I mean, have we received bad counsel before? People giving us things that we really don't need issues that they're going to cause, yet in this moment, his conscience gets the better of him. And he thinks, hang on a minute, this is the Lord's anointed. God has put him in place. Who am I to end Saul's life? Who am I, even though Saul is after mine, who am I to deal with Saul, how I feel he should be dealt with, so I'm going to spare his life. And then in 1 Samuel chapter 25, just a chapter on, David, sorry, beg your pardon, that David has been kind to a man's livelihood. And he's kept his men from doing any harm to these workers that are out in the field shearing their sheep. And when he sends his men to go and ask for a little bit of help from this guy who he clearly has protected, He's given an abusive response, despite his kindness towards them. And David, of course, is not happy. You wouldn't be. I've looked after you, I've looked after all your men and your women and your servants as they've been out in the fields. I've looked after your, your, your cattle and your sheep and your goats. I've made sure, while I was here, that we didn't touch anything and that nobody else touched anything either. So we're just asking for a little bit back from you. Just a, a tiny bit. We don't want a lot, but we want a little bit back. And Nabal, as we see, um, is a man of a bitter heart. Let's put it like that. And David, of course, then is not happy. And he seeks to get even. Yet this time, he receives wise counsel... This is where we, first, we see the first uh, lady on there. And it is indeed. Abigail, Nabal's wife, gives David some wise counsel. Now that isn't a sweeping statement that all females are wise. <clears throat> Neither am I saying all men are wise. Amen, brothers. <laughs> but indeed, David receives some wise counsel. And let's have a look at 1 Samuel chapter 25. Verse 14 through 32. One of the servants told Abigail, Nabal's wife, David sent messengers from the wilderness to give our master his greetings, but he hurled insults at them. He's not a wise chap. 
Um, yet these men were very good to us. They did not ill treat us. And the whole time we were out in the fields near them, nothing was missing. Night and day, they were a wall around us. The whole time we were herding our sheep near them. Now think it over and see what you can do. Because disaster is hanging over our master and his whole household. He is such a wicked man that no one can talk to him. Ever met anybody like that? Abigail acted quickly. She took 200 loaves of bread, two skins of wine, five dressed sheep, five sears of roasted grain, a hundred cakes of raisins and a hundred cakes of pressed figs and loaded them on donkeys. Then she told her servants, go on ahead, I will follow you. But she did not tell her husband Nabal. As she was riding her donkey in the mount, into a mountain ravine, there were David and his men descending towards her and she met them. David had just said, it's been useless, all my watching over this fellow's property in the wilderness, so that nothing of his went missing. He has paid me back evil for good. May God deal with David, be it ever so severely, if by morning I leave alive one male of who belonged to him. When Abigail saw David, she quickly got off her donkey and bowed down before David with her face to the ground. She fell at his feet and said, pardon your servant, my Lord, and let me speak to you. Hear what your servant has to say. Please pay no attention, my Lord, to that wicked man, Nabal. Also, my husband, she didn't say. Um, he is just like his name. His name means fool, and folly goes with him. And as for me, your servant, I did not see the men my Lord sent, and now, my Lord, as surely as the Lord your God lives, and as you live, since the Lord has kept you from bloodshed and from avenging yourself with your own hands, may your enemies and all who are intent on harming my Lord be like Nabal. And let this gift which your servant has brought to my Lord be given to the men who follow you. Please forgive your servant's presumption. The Lord your God will certainly make a lasting dynasty, dynasty for my Lord. Because you fight the Lord's battles and no wrongdoing will be found in you as long as you live. Even though someone is pursuing you to take your life, the life of my Lord will be bound securely in the bundle of the living, she's incredible, isn't she? Uh, by the Lord your God, but the, but the lives of your enemies uh, he will hurl away as from the pocket of a sling. It's like she knew David. When the Lord has fulfilled for my Lord every good thing he promised concerning him and has appointed him ruler over Israel, my Lord will not have on his conscience the staggering burden of needless bloodshed or of having avenged himself and when the Lord your God has brought my Lord's success remember your servant now David said to Abigail praise be to the Lord the God of Israel who has sent you today to meet me may you be blessed for your good judgment and for keeping me from bloodshed this day and from avenging myself with my own hands now if you zip on to verse 38 about 10 days later, the Lord struck Nabal and he died. David didn't need to do anything. David didn't need to do anything. In fact, he received good counsel from this lady, Abigail. And she tells him that what you should do is steer well clear of this man because his evil has marked his ways and make no mistake about it, the Lord is going to deal with him. You can hear how Abigail speaks, that she clearly has insight into the situation, that God has clearly gone before her and David yields and doesn't indeed go what he set out to do. And then finally, 1 Samuel chapter 26, and it's titled, David again spares Saul's life. David has another opportunity to take Saul's life. And he again receives not the good counsel that he's just had, but bad counsel. But this time, instead of his conscience getting the better of him, David responds in such a way that shows his progression. He's learned along the way. He's listened, he's applied, and then in this moment, he makes sure that he does indeed that, makes the right choice. 
And that's uh, verse, uh, t- uh, chapter 26, verse 5 through 11. Then David set out and went to the place where Saul had camped. He saw where Saul and Abner, son of Ner, the commander of the army, had laid down. Saul was lying inside the camp with the army camped around him. Now Dave, David kicks again into this ninja-like stealth. Um, and when uh, David then asked Abim- uh, that guy, uh, the Hittite and the other chap, you know, Joab's brother, you remember, uh, who will go down into the camp with me to Saul. I'll go with you, said Abishai. So David and Abishai went to the army by night, and there was Saul lying asleep inside the camp with his spear stuck in the ground near his head. Abner and the soldiers were lying around him. David is inside the camp in a completely hostile environment, everybody's asleep, and nobody has heard David. Incredible. So David and Abishai went, and then Abishai said to David, Today God has given your enemy into your hands. Surely you would think that, wouldn't you? You've had the one opportunity, David. Now surely, here's the second one. Seize it with both hands. In fact, you don't even have to move, David. I'll take the spear and I'll finish him and I'll only strike once. Listen to what he says. Today God has given your enemy into your hands. Now let me pin him to the ground with one thrust of the spear. I won't strike him twice. But David said to Abishai, don't destroy him. Who can lay a hand on the Lord's anointed and be guiltless? As surely as the Lord lives, listen how he responds. The Lord himself will strike him. Or his time will come and he will die. Or he will go into battle and perish. But the Lord forbid that I should lay a hand on the Lord's anointed. Now get the spear and the water jug that are near his head and let's go. Just so David leaves a mark to say we have been and I again have spared your life. Now, in these three moments, David has learned a lot. His conscience and God's word have convicted him. A wise woman has prevented him from the wrong actions. And then his wisdom, as he's learned along the way, shines through in the final account. He has learned, hasn't he, by his response that we see in chapter 27, that God will bring about his plan and his purposes. It's not your time, it's his. It's not our time, it's his. And David is now certain because he's seen it happen. You know, the the joy of experience of a Christian walk, because we get to know and to see that God's hand is on the situation. God is in control. And even in the midst of, of what seems to be the right decision. We have to make sure that we're consulting the Lord and we're doing what we're supposed to do. We're searching the word. We're seeking good counsel. The question remains for all of us is what are we doing in situations that we're presented with? How are we handling these moments? Do we surround ourselves with good counsel? Are we giving good counsel? Are we making sure we're looking into the word to know that when somebody does come with the questions that we're able to answer in a God honouring way. This is what we're called to do as the church, not just to come and sit and enjoy. Yes, that's great. But as Christians, our responsibility is to serve God wholeheartedly. And when the moment comes, we're ready to listen. We're ready to give good counsel, not just counsel that's going to make them feel good. Not just counsel that's going to help them, you know, just have a happy day. No, to give real truth advice. And sometimes good advice is hard to take, isn't it? Sometimes good advice is not really what we want. I just wanted you to tell me what I wanted to hear, said Matthew many times. The reality is, church, that we have to seek good counsel. To be attentive to what our brothers and sisters in Christ are saying. And to trust that they're in the word. Faithfully looking. Faithfully doing. Faithfully worshipping. Faithfully serving. Because when we see that, we know that the council's going to be good. It's not just because it sounds right. 
but we know that their heart's desire is for each and every one of us, as we come together as the church, to serve God wholeheartedly and to bring glory to him. Church, there are so many ideas and opportunities that arrive into our path. And often we're seeking God on some decisions, not all of them, because they're too insignificant to bring to the Lord, aren't they? And now we never say it, but if we're not careful, that can be our heart sometimes. Lord, this, this is just a small decision, so I'll make it. And what do small decisions usually lead to? Big mistakes. If we're not careful, we can react or make poor decisions because we're just looking for a simple answer. And looking at David's journey can help us. Firstly, his conscience. If something doesn't sit comfortably or feel 100%, then it's probably not. Have you ever had that moment where just in the pit of your stomach, you know that something's not quite right? And I'll ask you the question as well. Have you ever had that moment where you've told that little thing to shut up? Because I'm doing it. I'm just going to get on with it. What else can I do? You know, you feel like you're backed into a corner. It's the only decision I can make. Souls come into the cave. Nobody else is in here. We could strike him down and leave from the back and nobody would ever know. Church, we have to be so careful that we are listening to what our conscience is saying. We're listening. If it feels something doesn't feel right, then what we've learned, haven't we, is there probably isn't. Is it probably isn't right. We know in our spirit, and the key is not to quench it, as we've seen over the past few weeks in our Bible studies, not to quench the Spirit or to grieve the Holy Spirit, but to make sure we're in tune and we're listening to what the Spirit says. Secondly, the counsel and the friends we keep. His closest companions seem bent on revengeance. And that comes out in David in the second scenario. If you listen to it often enough, you think it's right. You with me? They're bent on revengeance. That's what they want to do, to get vengeance. To strike, you know, this guy's wronged us. So let's sort him out. And if you listen to bad counsel long enough, it becomes the right thing to do. Not because it is the right thing, but because you've listened to it so much that you think like it's the right thing to do. So we have to make sure that we're seeking good counsel. And in this instance, good counsel comes out of nowhere. In fact, good counsel arrives from Nabal's wife, Abigail. And she allows David to see, David, there's a bigger picture. Don't just do what you think is right in the moment, but rather listen to what God has got in store for you. Listen to his plans and his purposes. Don't just go at it in your own way. God has got a bigger picture and his providence, his hand of providence is on the situation. Then David, in the third scenario, has gleaned from these life lessons and he knows then, because he's seen it firsthand, that God will deal with the nonsense. Amen? God will always deal with the nonsense. But there might be lessons for us to learn in it. Sometimes it's patience. Sometimes it's trust and faith. Sometimes we need a kick. Sometimes we've got something to learn, even from the difficulty. And he's able to see, though, through all of it, that God is in absolute control. And he's able to show his companion as well. So not only is David able to react to the situation to make the right decision in the third scenario, but he's also able to share that with his close companion and say, no, that's not what we're going to do, and this is why. So he's listened to good counsel, he's learned from good counsel, and now he's applying it. That is a picture for us, isn't it? So many times, if we're not careful, we go our own route. Church, we need to make sure that we are listening and seeking God's will, not our own. Keeping good counsel, searching for the right step, not our own steps. And this church is what the word is saying to us this morning but there's a picture in here too of our saviour the lord jesus christ 
He could have called legions of angels. He could have stepped out of the situation as the world took him to the cross. He could have quite easily dealt with it, but he didn't. He allowed it to happen. Why? Because it was God's will. That's why he allowed it. That's why he allowed just mere mortal human beings to nail him to a cross. To thrust a crown of thorns upon his head. That's why he allowed all of that to happen. So that he could bear our sin and our shame. So that in and through that cross, as dark and as difficult as it was, that he might bring us life. And we know then, because he was obedient to what God's will was, because he was obedient to the cross, even death on a cross, that he has the victory. As he's seated at the right hand of the Father, interceding for you and for me. Jesus made the right decisions. He listened to the Father's will and he had victory. Amen? Amen. Church, if that's not a lesson for us, if this this morning isn't a lesson for us, then I've got nothing. We have to listen to what the word says and take our example from the Lord Jesus Christ. How did he react? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you this morning once again for your word. Father, I thank you that even in this warm room that we've been able to listen and to worship you. Father, I pray that your word might have settled on hearts, on each of us, that Father, we'd be attentive to what you've got to say to us. We just thank you for your goodness and for your blessing, Father God. And we pray as we continue our worship together now that you would just have your hand upon us. We ask these prayers in Jesus' precious name. Amen.